the topic for today is uh, writing equation of lines uh, when given word problems. Um, and now it's going to be the same exact math that we've been doing before, but just trying to set it up and finding uh, what we're given in the problem. The trickiest part for you will be deciding whether you're given the slope, the y-intercept, ordered pairs, so on and so forth. So we'll try to, you know, break it down so we can see when we're given each of these things. Okay. Um, so my first example here is a damaged plane is flying at a height of 500 feet and is looting, losing altitude at a rate of 80 feet per minute. Write an equation to model the situation. Okay, so again, anytime I'm looking for a linear equation, I'm going to start by writing y is equal to blank x plus blank. And my goal here is to fill in the slope and the y-intercept so that I can uh, have the equation of the line. Now I'm going to flip back here for a second. And we're just going to look at how to identify whether you're given the slope, whether you're giving uh, the y-intercept, or ordered pairs. All right? So you could get any, usually any two of those. Important things to note. Okay, So the y-intercept, or your b, typically represents a starting amount. It could also be like a one-time fee or something that only happens once does not change based on use or based on the x variable, okay? <clears throat> Next up, we've got the slope. And the slope typically represents a rate of change. A lot of times, but not always, you have to be careful. A lot of times, if you see the word rate, uh, it'll deal with the slope. Again, you can't always use that, but that, that sometimes helps you if you're not sure. Um, it would be sometimes a recurring cost for a bill or something you have to keep paying or something like that. And it is something that will change based on use or based on the x variable. Okay. All right. Finally, here ordered pairs typically uh, look like you know after three weeks there were two fish. He had twenty dollars left after five days. You have to remember if they don't tell you which one represents x and which one represents y, remember that x changes y. X is your independent variable. Y is your dependent variable. Okay. Um, so again, if you had after three weeks, there were two fish, the number of weeks are changing the fish. So we would put the three first and the two second, but remember that could be given any way. So if you said he had $20 left after five days, the days would be changing the dollars. So we would actually put the five first and the 22nd. Okay. So you got to be careful when you're doing those. So ordered pairs look like a specific point in time that they're looking at, um, you know, for the linear model. The slope looks like a rate, and the y-intercept looks like a one-time fee or a starting amount. So we'll go over here and take a look at what we have. Damage plane is flying at a height of 5,000 feet and is losing altitude at a rate of 80 feet per minute. Okay, the first thing that I would look at here would just be the fact that this is a rate of 80 feet per minute. Okay, that is a good sign here that that's going to be our slope. So I'm going to fill that in here, and I'll do this incorrectly for a second, but then we'll talk about it. So I'm just going to put an 80 in here. And then it says, it, um, a damaged plane is, plane is flying at a height of 500 feet. Okay, so if we look at this 500 feet, and actually I'm going to fill this in here. So we have the slope, so I'm going to use this little tool here. The slope was, we said, 80. And the height would be um, 5,000 feet. That's what the plane kind of started out at in this problem. So they, they didn't say after 10 minutes the plane was at 5,000 feet. This is a starting amount. And we said that in a linear equation word problem, a starting amount is typically y-intercept. So we'll go over here and we'll fill in the starting amount is 5,000 feet. There is a mistake here, and I'm going to let you guys see if you can find it. Okay. We'll read it one more time. Damaged plane is flying at a height of 5,000 feet and is losing altitude at a rate of 80 feet per minute. So you may take a guess here on what we're going to need. And what we need here is, since this is a rate of change that is decreasing, we're going to need a negative sign in front of the 80. So they actually gave us a negative slope here, that the plane is losing altitude. So that should be negative 80x plus 500. Okay. Another important thing to fill in just as you're doing these problems is write down what the x and the y variable represent. Okay, so you don't always have to do this in your work, but it's very important to understand what these mean, especially when we get to these little extending questions at the end. Okay, so let's look here first off at what the x variable represents. Okay, so this 
So again, we need to know that x changes y. That'll help us identify which one is which. And the two things we're comparing here are the altitude and I think that's so the minutes. So you can usually see it in the slope if you have the slope feet per minute. So it would be the feet, the minute. You just need to figure out are the feet changing the minutes or are the minutes changing the feet or the altitude? And in this case, the minutes, the time, is changing the altitude measured in feet. So the minutes are changing the altitude in feet. So that means that our x variable, anytime we plug in something for x, it has to deal with time or minutes. And anytime we plug something in for y, it has to deal with altitude or feet. Okay, so once again, I'll write this here just one more time to show you. So this is the minutes. And this would deal with the altitude in feet. Now, it says if the plane, so here's our first extending question. If the plane is one and a half hours from the nearest airport, can the plane make it to the airport before it needs to make a crash landing? And if you look at this one, you might think, well, okay, so one and a half hours. What am I going to do here? One and a half hours is a time. It's going to have to go in for the time variable, which is x. Now, the problem with this is, is that one and a half hours is not written as a, a, a function of minutes here. It's written as hours. So what we're going to have to do is convert this to minutes first by multiplying by 60. So 1.5 hours times 60 will tell us that that's the same as 90 minutes. So our airplane is 90 minutes um, from an airport. But what we'll have to do now is to see what the altitude will be. So we're looking for the altitude when the time is 90 minutes. Okay, and I'll give you a second here to punch this in your calculator and see what you come up with. So we'll take negative 80 times 90 plus 5,000. And you should be coming up with negative 2,200. Okay. Now, again, if you're curious, well, what does that mean? Y represents the feet or the altitude. So we found that after an hour and a half, our plane has an altitude of negative 2,200 feet, which means... Heck, our plane is in the ground, which means that it's it's already, you know, lost altitude way before that. So can the plane make it to the airport? The answer here would be no. It's unable to. It's going to have to make some sort of crash landing before it gets to an airport because if it's at a negative altitude, that means it must have crashed before. Okay, next question. What is the maximum time the plane can stay in the air? Okay, we are looking for what is the maximum time the plane can stay in the air, which means that we're looking for a time variable. That means we're solving for x, and we're going to have to plug in something for y or the altitude. We're solving for x because we know it's we're looking for the time. It says, what is the time? So negative 80x plus 5,000. So we're going to have to plug something in for y. And this is tricky here. Think about if your plane is, you know, flying here. And I'm a very poor artist, so I'll do my best here. But here's my... We'll give it a propeller. I'll make fun of my uh, my bad drawing. If our plane is slowly descending here, maximum time it will be in the air is the time right before it hits the ground. And at the ground, if you think about, you know, this was the starting height, it's 5,000. The altitude at the ground is going to be zero. So what we could do here is plug in zero for the altitude, and that'll tell us this time window from here to here will tell us how long the plane's been in the air. Go ahead and do that. So we get 0 is equal to negative 80x plus 5,000. And just like an equation, I'm going to, um, you could add the 80x over, but I don't want to confuse people, so I'll move the 5,000 over. I would personally probably move the 80x over, but sometimes people don't like to move their x's around. And then finally, if we divide by the negative 80 on both sides, again, I'll give you a second to punch that in your calculator here. If you have your negative 5,000 and you divide it by negative 80, you should be coming up with approximately 62.5 minutes. Okay, we know that that's a minute um, time because uh, the x variable is measured in minutes. You could also say an hour, uh, you know, an hour and two minutes and a half or hour and two and a half minutes because, again, 60 minutes is one hour. That's another way to do that. Okay, so the maximum time the plane can stay in the air is 62.5 minutes.
ahead and move to another example. So that was when the math is probably the easiest in that they're giving you the slope and the y-intercept. That's the, the easiest start to the problem because you can just write the equation right away. Here's the next one. So John is John started a new lifting program and eating routine to try and gain weight for football. On his new plan, he gains 1.2 pounds per week. Three weeks into his routine, he weighed 176 pounds. Write a linear equation to model John's weight for any number of weeks. Okay, um, I'm actually going to start this one by identifying our variables right away. So I wanted to do that in the last one. I kind of do that a little later, but I want to just identify what the x and the y are. Remember that x changes y. And if we look at our two variables here, the two things that are changing, it looks like his weight is changing. And the weeks are changing. Okay, so now we have to ask ourselves: Is his weight changing the week, or are the weeks changing his weight? And in this case, the weeks x makes more sense this way are changing his weight. Again, you don't always have to do this in your problems, but it's a very good idea to do this because it makes your life so much easier once you get down to these other steps and you really understand what's going on in the problem. Okay, so we're here now. Um, so now that we're at this step, we'll go ahead and look at what we're given here. So it says, John started lifting routine, blah, 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 blah. On his new plan, he gains 1.2 pounds per week. And in this case, that pounds per week is, and, and since the pounds are changing and the weeks are changing, this is going to be our slope. Okay, so we've got 1.2 is going to be our M here. And now we'll look at what else we have. So we'll either have a starting amount again, which will be our y-intercept, or we're going to have an ordered pair. And in this case, it says three weeks into his routine, he weighed 176 pounds. It doesn't tell us what he weighed before he started the routine because that would be our y-intercept. In this case, he gave us a certain amount of weeks and a certain amount of pounds. Since the weeks are changing the pounds, that must mean that the three comes first in the ordered pair, and your 176 must come second in the ordered pair. And again, that cannot be a B. We can't just put 76 in for B, 176 in for B, because that's not what he started at. It's three weeks into the routine. And now from here, we're set up to kind of do our math. I'm gonna write my Y equals blank X plus blank. I'm gonna try and fill in the blanks here. And we're going to start by filling in what we know. So we know that um, our slope is 1.2. So let's go ahead and fill that in. So that can go in here. He's gaining weight, so it's not negative. He's not losing weight. And now we're just going to have to solve for B. So what I'm going to do is fill in my Y coordinate is equal to my slope times 3. And then we'll put plus B here. We're solving for the y-intercept. Okay. Now at this point, if we take our 3 times our 1.2, that'll give us 176 equals 3.6 plus B. And again, at this step, we're going to have to solve for our variable here, which is B. So if we subtract the 3.6 to the other side, you should be coming up with about a y-intercept of 172.4. We'll fill that in up here. 172.4 would be his uh, y-intercept for this problem. That takes care of the first step, and that's the most important step for the problem. Okay. Now that we've done all this work to make this equation, again, let's go ahead and start plugging these things in to find out what we know. All right. It says, what was John's weight after 12 weeks? Well, easy. Okay. We know that x is the weeks, so that 12 is going to have to go in for our x variable. And then we're going to have to solve for the weight, which is y. We don't know what that is. So we'll go ahead and just take our equation. We had y equals 1.2. And then since x we have a number for, I'm going to plug that in. So 12 weeks here. So we'll have y is equal to. And then if we punch this all in our calculator here again, some of you uh, might need your calculator just to plug this in here real quick. 172.4 would be 186.8. Okay, and now again, very important to write the units here. That would be pounds because this is weight. 
So after 12 weeks, he's up to 186.8 pounds. And if this was someone, you know, who was trying to make a certain weight for football, um, you know, that might be important to them to find out how soon do I need to start this program. All right. So uh, next question. How much did John weigh before he start just before he started his new routine? There's a few ways to do this. Okay. The best way I would think would be to look at your equation. Okay. The y intercept, if we go back here for a second, the y intercept is a starting amount. Okay. So that B or that number at the end without the X is a starting amount. That tells you how much he start, what his weight was when he started. In this case, this 172.4 tells us how much he weighed just before he started. There's your answer. Okay, they're ask, asking us kind of in a sneaky way, what's the y-intercept? Now that you're here, again, the 172.4, um, another way to solve this would be just plug in a zero for the x. Okay, zero time has gone by. What is his weight? That would be another way to find it out. You should get the same answer. And then finally, how long will it take John to weigh 200 pounds? Well, here we go. We would have uh, y is equal to uh, 1.2x plus 172.4. Again, we're looking for how long it will take. So what I'm going to do here is erase the y because I have a weight. We know that the weight is y. So I'm going to plug in 200. And this might be, he might want to be 200 pounds before football season starts, and he wants to figure out how long that's going to take him. We'll subtract 172.4 from both sides. We're just solving this like an equation. Okay, and if you subtract your 200 minus your 172.4, you should be coming up with 27.6 here. So we have 1.2 is equal to 27.6. Sorry, 1.2x that should be. And then if we divide by 1.2 here, we should be coming up with x is equal to about 23 weeks. Okay, and that's a pretty long period of time. So if John is trying to make weight for football, he probably wants to start this ASAP to be able to gain that much weight for that period of time. Okay. Biologists have found that the number of chirps some crickets make per minute is related to the temperature. The relationship is very close to being linear. When crickets chirp 124 times a minute, it is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. When they chirp 172 times a minute, it's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Write a linear equation to model the number of cricket chirps for any specific temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? So again, good place to start is by identifying what our X and our Y variables are. This will just help us later down the road. It's the stuff you really don't want to skip. Remember that X changes Y. And we can see right from that first sentence here, biologists have found that the number of cricket chirps some crickets make per minute is related to temperature. Okay, so we know that these are going to be the two variables. We just have to see if the temperature is changing the chirps per minute or are the chirps per minute changing the temperature. And in this case, it makes a little bit more sense that the um, temperature, so the temperature is changing the chirps per minute. And one thing that might be a little confusing on this one is that since we have a rate as our y coordinate, chirps per minute will not be our slope. Okay, chirps per minute will deal with a y coordinate since that's what the y variable represents. Okay, so we'll go back here and see what we've got as far as um, slope, y intercept, or ordered pairs. Now, they don't really tell me a rate of change. Now, you have to be careful here because a rate of change in this case would have to be the increase in chirps per minute per one degree or per, you know, five degrees or whatever your slope would be. Okay, that would be what the slope would look like. So I don't see something like that in the problem. Okay. The y-intercept would be a starting amount. So at some starting temperature, like at, you know, zero degrees, here's what the chirps per minute are. And then finally, what I do see here, though, are y's and x's. So I see chirps per minute, which I know deal with y. And I see uh, temperatures, which deal with x's. So here we've got two ordered pairs in this problem. So in this case, I've got the ordered pair 68, 124. And I've also got the ordered pair 
80 and 172. 172. Okay. Now, from here, we're going to have to go ahead and write our equation. So it says write a linear equation to model the number of crooked charts, blah, 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 blah. Let's do y equals blank x plus blank to start things out. From this point, we're going to, again, have to try and figure out what the slope and the y-intercept are. In this case, we don't have the slope, so I'm going to have to do my y2 minus y1 formula to find that. So remember that the slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So let's go ahead and calculate that real quick now. Our x's and our y's. I'm going to go ahead and subtract 172 minus 124 on the top. And on the bottom, we'll do 80 minus 68. And this should give us our slope. So 172 minus 124 should give us 48. And on the bottom here, this should give us 12. So that should give us a slope of 4. That should reduce to 4. Okay. And again, the meaning of that slope is telling us for every degree that you increase your, um, your temperature, chirps per minute should increase by 4. All right. Now from here again, I need to still find the B, so let's plug everything in we know. Let's plug in, we'll, we'll use the top ordered pair, we'll use 68, 124 for this one. So plug in the Y, 124 is equal to 4 times, I'll put the X coordinate in in a second, and I'm solving for B, so the X coordinate was 68, try to stick with the same color scheme here. Okay, so now we're just going to have to go ahead and take our 4 times our 68 to start. That'll give us 272. So we got 272 here. Plus B is equal to 124. And if we take our 272 and we subtract it from our 124, that should be giving us 148, excuse me, negative 148 for our B. So to be a negative 148. And again, I would go back and rewrite this as y equals 4x minus 148 instead of plus negative. It's just a better way of, of writing our answer there. And that looks like a good start to uh, part A. All right. Now going ahead with part B, about how many times would a cricket chirp per minute if it was 50 degrees outside? Okay, that's a good question. Let's figure that out. So what we'll go ahead and do is we'll say y equals... 4 times 50 minus 148. Again, we know that 50 degrees is a temperature, and temperature deals with x. So that 50 is going to have to go in here. So 4 times 50 gives me 200. And if you take your 200 minus your 148, you should get y is equal to 52. And again, 52, that Y deals with chirps per minute. So this tells us that that's 52 chirps per one minute. All right, so we got one more left. And I know it's kind of a long video, but uh, again, there's a lot of material. This is a very uh, important section as far as, you know, keystone exams and, um, you know, just, just getting through algebra. This comes up all the time, algebra two as well. At what temperature would the model predict crickets to stop chirping? Okay, so if the crickets stop chirping, and we're, again, we're looking for at what temperature, so we don't know what the temperature is, and we've got to figure out, you know, we're looking for X, but we've got to figure out what we plug in here for Y. If crickets stop chirping, that means that our chirps per minute has to be zero. So we'll plug in zero for the Y, and then we'll put in our 4X, minus 148. Okay, so we're almost there. Now to solve for our x variable, let's add the 148 to both sides. So we'll take 148 and add it to the other side. So we get, uh, excuse me, 148 is equal to 4x. And if we divide by 4 on both sides, you should be coming up with x is equal to 37. And again, this 37 is in degrees Fahrenheit. So we can see that crickets stop chirping probably around 37 degrees Fahrenheit. If this model holds true, um, you know, at further and further uh, values away from, from the average temperatures of X. Okay. So again, in this case, we're looking at 
X variables would deal with temperature, Y deals with chirps per minute. The trickier ones are where you plug in zero for the Y. So always don't forget that you could plug in zero for Y or zero for X if you're not sure what to plug in. A lot of times that might be um, your issue.